thanks, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, this is my first Creative Mornings, um, and so I'm really uh, excited. This is such a wonderful venue and such a wonderful group, such a wonderful reception, and I think um, hopefully we'll have a pretty engaging and hopefully inspiring time today. Um, so yeah, because of that introduction, I don't really have to say much about me um, other than that I do wear sort of many hats in, across the community. And I was asked by Nathan to make this a sort of more personal take on the work that I do and to touch on water, which I definitely will, um, but to really kind of give you a window into my motivations uh, for doing this and how I, how I came to this place uh, in addition to talking about the subject matter so I'm going to do that. So, and, and I, so I, I've been warned previously that you should never pre-apologize for things, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, so I hope that we can uh, get through kind of a wide range of material without, without me rambling too much. <laughs> I'm going to do my best to uh, make it a point when I have a point that I want it to be a take home throughout this talk. So. Um, yeah, so I've titled this talk today, What Are You Talking About?, which is actually a shout out to a video in the Don't Just Sit There, Do Something series, which he said all wrong, um, that, is, that is, has the same title, which is talking about the climate impacts of water, and we'll see a clip of it in, in a little bit. Um, but uh, I think that when it comes to climate change and sustainability issues in general, uh, we really need to take a step back and sort of reevaluate the system that we're talking about, which includes all of us. Um, so to do that step back, my first slide is this, which, if you do not immediately recognize it, is a picture of Earth. This is as Carl Sagan called it, the pale blue dot. That dot right there, that's our planet. He said, that's here, that's home. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being that ever was lived out their lives on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. And I like to start with that because I think it's important to ground us, right? And remember that this planet is essentially, a clo it's a closed system, more or less, right? We have resources on it and in it, and we use those resources, we move them from one place to another, we change their form, but we have this fiction uh, that we operate under that humanity is somehow separate from the natural world, like right, the human world that we are currently in, right, in this room, listening to a speaker uh, on a Friday morning with mugs in our hands, and we forget that everything in this room came from somewhere else on this planet. It was manufactured, these chairs are all made from wood, right, the air is contiguous with the air outside. We are sharing this ecosystem um, and no offense to Threadbare, with probably a few insects and arachnids at this moment. Um, <laughs> and and we, we never really are away, right? The separation, the separation is false. Of course, it's a pale blue dot because most of it's covered with water, right? And so we, we look at images like this and we think, this is nature, this is pristine, this is separate. Um, from us, but it, but it never really is. And that's my first take home, actually, uh, is that the human world and the natural world are the same world. <clears throat> to illustrate, here are three large mammals in a marine ecosystem, right? And we look at pictures like this and we say, oh, that's clearly nature, right? That is, you know, fall trees. It is also my backyard. Um, which is in the wilderness of Swissville. <laughs> so, I mean, we really need to sort of rethink our assumptions of how we relate to the world around us and be more conscious of these interrelations and the entangled nature of really everything. Uh, because a lot of our practices maybe aren't so conscious about that. You know, when we start thinking of resources in a way that's exploitive and not as integrated, then we start seeing things like clear-cut forests and other land use practices that can destroy habitat and lead to species extinctions. So where I come to from that, or where I come to this 
from is really a place of, this is gonna be a little bit different for, from what you typically think of when you think of environmentalism, right? Like there's this thread of, you know, I care about all the creatures and I, it's, just a, it's a very emotional um, and empathy kind of thought is what people have. Um, and yes, there's that, right? But where I come to this work from is really a place of common sense and logic, right? This is, if we accept the other part as true, right, that this is one planet, then we really have to um, logically consider the end result of our actions in this system, right? It's never made sense to me since I was a kid that um, we think of this as being completely ridiculous, right? The, the over full closet, just stuff everything in the closet, it's fine. Um, that's a joke on the longstanding uh, kind of idiom in our culture. But at the same time, this is totally normal, right? And we just accept this as part of how we operate, which is just never made any sense to me. Um, so <clears throat> I come to this work looking at land use practices, looking at our waste stream um, from a place of really trying to figure out what the right answer is, because clearly we have a few answers that maybe aren't, aren't so effective in the long term. And a lot of that work, as has been mentioned, has been on climate change. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that for a minute and get us back to our theme for today, which is water. So climate change, right? The big three, fossil fuels, is being caused by our use of these materials for energy. And burning coal, oil, usually in the form of uh, gasoline and natural gas, is great because it gives us heat. And heat is an amazing thing that helps us heat our homes uh, and cook our food uh, and live comfortable lives. Uh, but the challenge is that this heat also creates a little chemistry lesson for you today. Combining any hydrocarbon with oxygen in the air results in carbon dioxide and water. And that carbon dioxide traps heat in our atmosphere. Um, carbon dioxide is the most common, what's called greenhouse gas, uh, that's trapping heat. It's not the only one. There are several others, um, but most of them are also generated from fossil fuel extraction and use, as well as industrial agriculture. Um, so <clears throat> the levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere have been going up. They've been trapping heat like a blanket around the planet for years. And this is a, uh, a video that NASA put together showing cooler than average areas on the planet uh, versus warmer than average. The cooler are in the blues and the warmer are in the yellows. Uh, and reds and oranges over time. Five-year averages since 1880. And I like to show this instead of a graph because I think it very clearly illustrates what's been happening. This is about the time I came along and, you know, we're, we're moving in one direction. So, clearly, that's a little different than where we started, right? Um, and it's because of our interactions, right? And what we're doing uh, around the world. I mentioned that it's like a blanket uh, trapping heat and it has impacts, uh, not just um, in increased heat, but also in the way water moves. So we're seeing increasing lengths of drought, uh, increasing severity, uh, of droughts around the world, um, dr uh, drier places also are more prone to wildfires, <clears throat> as we saw tragically in Paradise, California last year. Um, and then on the flip side of that, we also see an increase in severe storms uh, and the severity uh, and intensity of, of storms that we've seen. And a lot of people, you know, these are big concerns that can often seem far away and can seem very abstract. Um, so I like to point out to folks um, that this, there are climate impacts no matter where you live on this planet, right? Um, it's happening everywhere. In Pittsburgh, just for a little historical reference, this flood uh, happened in 1936. Uh, it was a 42-foot river level rise, um, which was due to massive rainfall 
after a warmer than average winter melt of ice, right? So there are risks here. And we don't just see the risks in big storms like this, really massive historical proportions floods, but we see those all the time. We all lived through what last year was like in rainfall, right, in this region. Uh, we saw landslides, we saw um, floods, we saw, uh, actually, so I do sit on the, another hat that I wear on the Board of Health, um, you know, we see an increasing then amount of mold and allergens and there are actual impacts. And of course, this hits me personally, getting back to the personal um, point, uh, I'm not technically from Pittsburgh. I don't know if I should admit that. Um, I've been here for 11 years, but I'm originally from a small town in Delaware, uh, which is at sea level and will basically be underwater in 2100, no matter what we do at this point. My dad still calls this town in Delaware home, and he put solar panels on his house a couple of years ago. And so my hope is that by his actions and by the actions of the rest of us, that we can make it so far fewer places will we'll have this fate. Um, so what have I worked on over the years? I'm, I'm pretty new to my role at Sustainable Pittsburgh. Um, but in the past, I have done, uh, as was mentioned, the video series, uh, Don't Just Sit There, Do Something. <sighs> Which, which, in which I dressed up as a number of different characters, including this one, pro tip, if you don't want people to constantly ask you to wear the cape, don't invent a superhero character for yourself where you're wearing a cape and a mask. Um, so if you want to see video, those are available at DJST for don't just sit there TV. But um, this was, I put this up here because this is a creative effort to make the information about climate change accessible and engaging for people in a way that doesn't require sitting through an entire documentary or doing a whole bunch of your own research, YouTube video format, you know, really trying to get at pieces of this uh, puzzle in a, uh, in, in an accessible way. And so there's a lot of characters, uh, including a scientist, because I'm a scientist by training, even though in the videos I'm wearing a lab coat and everyone told me I had to wear the lab coat. I said, not all scientists wear lab coats and I don't regularly, so, but they said wear the lab coat and I said, okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> the, the, I'm gonna show you just a clip from the video that I mentioned in the beginning, what are you talking about? Think of it like the planet having a fever. A fever of 11 degrees would be catastrophic. Even just a few degrees increase in global temperature will make a big difference in how water moves around the planet. The Earth has a fever, and the only prescription is more cowbell. A warmer climate also causes more evaporation and lets the air hold more moisture, be more humid, which sets the stage for extreme precipitation. You can't ever pin one event like Boston's super snowy winter on climate change. That kind of snowfall is, however, in line with the increase in extreme weather predicted from man-made climate change, as are shifts in air currents like the frigid polar vortex winds that suddenly seem to visit us more often. Heavy downpours are predicted to happen two to five times more frequently across the U.S. as more torrential rainstorms are already happening. It's also important to remember that heavy downpours don't just happen when it's warm. During winter months or in colder areas, these storms mean more blizzards. Will we flood the planet? Wait and see. Um, not a lot of people are exposed to this information in ways that they can understand or connect to these larger impacts, and that's really important. I was just having a conversation before this talk, and I asked a couple of audience members to remind me if I didn't make this point, but most people don't have access to this. In the past year, we've actually seen media coverage of climate change fall off as we've watched the impacts worsen and worsen, right? So it's imperative that we have conversations about ending climate silence. And I put this up here too, just to make the point that it's not just the natural systems that are at risk, it's, it's people, right? We're integrated, we're entangled here. There's a lot, this is a super busy slide and you don't have to read the whole thing. Um, but I put this up here to make the point that there's a lot of interactions here between our culture and uh, the impacts and that they aren't distributed equally. 
right? Environmental justice and climate justice are real things. It, around the world and here at home, it's the people among us with the least that are impacted the most, that are the least resilient to the changes. Um, and as you can see, many of these drivers, pathways, and outcomes involve water, um, and the social factors are, are evident. So, so when we talk about changing, um, not just what's happening with climate change, but also what's happening with waste, and also what's happening uh, with land use. All of these ways in which we interact with the world around us, we have to make sure that it, uh, these are solutions that work for and factor in everybody. These are all folks from uh, Pittsburgh, and here's three more. <laughs> This, this is me at the water steps right here on the north side with my kids uh, summer, last summer, no, two summers ago. Um, I'm not from Pittsburgh, but my kids are. You know? And uh, they'll be 89 and 91 in the year 2100, hopefully, uh, with luck. Uh, and so I want them, of course, to enter to inherit a world that doesn't flood them or scorch them or prevent them from growing food, right? Um, which brings me to another point, uh, which about my personal motivations. Um, I, I'm saying this with a picture of my kids on the screen, but it's, for me, it's not about my kids specifically. It's about integrity and fairness and really, uh, acting with the knowledge and understanding that it cannot be just us, just we who now live that matter. Right? This is really about our responsibility to each other and to everyone that comes after us. Um, so yeah, I see this as a, a justice issue um, at its heart. It's common sense, it's logic, it's justice. So, in my role at Sustainable Pittsburgh, um, we address a lot of these different things. And when I think about the word sustainability, it's one of these words that's kind of maybe lost a little bit of its meaning over time as people say it over and over and over again. But I like to take things back to their root, right? Sustain sustain something, right? A way that we can keep doing the thing we're doing. We can keep enjoying our quality of life. We can keep, we can maybe hopefully improve being kind and inclusive to each other. Um, but it, it implies inherently that what we're doing right now is not a sustainable process, right? We have to improve uh, what we're doing um, to continue to have prosperity. And that's not just environment, that's also equity. And it's also economic prosperity too. And how do you move all these things together at the same time? That's Sustainable Pittsburgh's vision uh, to advance sustainability, that holistic definition of sustainability practice and policy in southwestern Pennsylvania. And the policy is important because uh, policy actually matters. This is, a, this is a picture from the National Climate Assessment, uh, not the most recent one, but the one from 2014. Um, which is put together by 13 federal agencies looking at what is happening with precipitation if we do nothing by the end of the century. And it's a pretty and colorful map here, but you can see these are some pretty big swings. 20 to 30% differences in increased or decreased precipitation across the continent, we're already seeing uh, that. Our area of the country has had a 71% increase in precipitation over the past 50 years. Um, or in heavy precipitation events, excuse me. Important distinction. Um, but there are areas where it's getting much, much drier too. Um, but this is what happens. Sorry. There we go. This is what happens if we make changes now, right? So the point I wanna illustrate here is that we have still an opportunity to do better, right? Some changes are gonna be baked in, but this is not a time to give up hope. This is a time to redouble our efforts to, to improve things. Um, and that's where we come into how. 
How do we solve this? Well, a collective problem requires collective action. I can't tell you the number of people that I've met who their opening line to me is an apology, right, doing this work, you know, where people come up and immediately it's, well, I still, I do drive an SUV, but I'm so happy to meet you, you know, or, or, or uh, well, I do eat meat, but, but I really care about this, you know. And we do have this very, deep sense and very individual sense of guilt. Like each of us individually is carrying the weight of this on our shoulders, right? If we're not changing our light bulbs fast enough or we're not, you know, making the individual uh, changes, then, then we've all is lost. But I, I, what I wanna point out here is that we have the opportunity and the imperative to remember that humans are most effective at doing things together and that it really is about finding ways to work with each other and create systems change, another thing that Sustainable Pittsburgh is all about, um, looking for ways to make the right thing also the easy thing for all of us. So to do that, we convene communities of business professionals in the sustainability field, of municipal leaders, um, and of other uh, nonprofit groups to uh, to advance practices, to learn from one another, to share best practices, uh, and to move things forward. We run several performance programs, including the Sustainable Pittsburgh Challenge, which is about to have its finale next week, um, which challenges workplaces to make more sustainable practices for people in a company or an organization or a university to do things together to green that institution. Um, and not just green, I shouldn't say that, because there's also, in all of our performance programs, the equity piece is there as well. You know, there are actions here that aren't specific to environment, but are specific to people as well, because this is an integrated approach. And I should also say that one of our performance programs is the Sustainable Pittsburgh Restaurant Program. Shout out to Threadbare Cider for being Sustainable Pittsburgh Restaurant <laughs> Program designated. Um, <laughs> And if you're interested in the other restaurants, I did leave some placards back there that you can, you can pick up. And you can find all the information at the uh, eatsustainably.org uh, website. Um, and we also do targeted regional action and special projects. One of the things that recently grew out, actually, of the restaurant program was this sculpture, the Straw Forward Sculpture, which was at the Carnegie Science Center for a month uh, in February. Uh, everything that you see in this marine landscape here uh, was discarded waste plastic. Um, straws were collected from 37 points, Sustainable Pittsburgh Restaurants and other organizations were involved with, uh, and the other, the animals, kind of the larger animals, many of them were created um, from materials dredged from our rivers with the help of partners at Allegheny Cleanways, at PRC, um, and other organizations uh, to draw attention to plastics waste as an issue. And so we're working on figuring out how to carry that forward, not just as an attention, uh, at, at, as an attention focal point, but also as a way to uh, improve the situation. And right now, uh, ongoing for three weeks, you can still sign up, is the I Am Sustainable Pittsburgh Challenge. Um, and there are some stickers for that in the back. Uh, so feel free to take a sticker, whether you're gonna get involved or not. Um, but this is a challenge that asks each of us to think about ways we can do, um, uh, Nathan talked earlier about baby steps, a little bit bigger steps, or even more baby steps, and some giant steps to improve our sustainability individually, but it also enables you to, to compete as a team, right? So your team can earn points, um, challenge other teams, et cetera, kind of getting at this collective impact uh, idea a little bit. Okay, so I know I'm running, probably running up against time, uh, but I encourage you to check that out. I am sustainablepittsburgh.com. Um, there are some really great prizes that are being given away. I don't think that the overnight stay at the Fairmont has been given away yet, or the overnight Tesla test drive. Um, there's, there's, and you know, there's lots of coupons and other gift cards. So I do encourage you to check it out. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm gonna wrap up pretty soon here, but this is another key point that was sort of an aha moment for me in doing this work, in talking about climate change to folks, and in really broaching any of these really 
uh, difficult and seemingly abstract, but really still clear and present uh, issues that we're all grappling with. And I'm not a psychologist, so I'm going to put that disclaimer out there, but this is one theory of human behavior that really spoke to me when I learned about it, self-determination theory, um, which basically says it's an explanation for why people, why anyone does anything, right? Um, and it says that we need three things to act as humans. We need autonomy. We need the feeling that we are choosing this path rather than it is being forced upon us. We need competence, so we need to feel like we can actually accomplish the thing. You know, I'm not gonna do auto repair on my car, I'm not even gonna try, because I don't know how, and I know I don't know how. Um, I will either have to hire someone to do it, or I will have to do a lot of uh, self-education before I can even attempt it. Um, and then the last piece is relatedness, which basically translates to community. We need to be together in it, as I said earlier. And so when I heard this, I was like, wow, that makes a lot of sense. And also, climate change messaging has gotten all of these wrong. <laughs> Everyone, right? Um, we need to do a better job of illustrating and understanding and sharing the reasons that this is a path we, we want to choose. Um, that a sustainable path is the path that we want. Not just we want to avoid all the horrible impacts, but this is why we want to do this. Cleaner air, cleaner water, better relationships to each other, better relationships with the world around us, preservation of species. You know, the list goes on. Um, <clears throat> we need to have accessible routes to actually do the things, right? We can't just say, hey, you, you, save the world. We're done. <laughs> Fixed it. <laughs> you know? And we need to make it so that this is a topic that people feel more comfortable bringing up at the Thanksgiving table, right? Because right now it's a, it's a situation where, you know, people are shy about even talking about this. Um, but it's a problem that we all need to grapple with. And one key way that I think, uh, and in, something that I think we need to inject into the conversation um, is hope and inspiration, because all of these challenges are big. Climate change, our solid waste issue, plastics, um, our uh, chronic uh, equity problems, our chronic, uh, in this region, air pollution problems, are all... Um, are all big problems that are very daunting. But it's important to have hope because, uh, and Noam Chomsky said it better than I can, so I'm just gonna rely on this quote. Um, if you assume that there is no hope, you guarantee there will be no hope. Uh, if you assume there's an instinct for freedom, that there are opportunities to change things, then there is a possibility that you can contribute to making a better world. We need to believe in each other and believe we can get there, uh, to get there. Usually I say uh, hope is not an option, it's necessary. Um, but my, that quote's better. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap up pretty shortly here um, and hopefully have a couple minutes for questions. Um, but I wanted to throw this picture up because I started with pictures of nature and humanity. Uh, and I want to end the same way. This is clearly a natural setting, right? This is a uh, windmill farm in Bradford County. Um, and I think this image clearly illustrates our choice and our choices, right? We've got a windmill farm and we've got this reservoir in the middle, back to water again. This is actually uh, fracking wastewater, the fracking wastewater uh, reservoir. And I think this just, just perfectly illustrates our choice, our relationship to the natural world and the decisions that we make and, and what the impacts are, right? This is our planet and it is the only one that we've got. Um, as Canadian educator Marshall McLuhan put it very uh, succinctly, there are no passengers on Spaceship Earth. We are all crew. So we are obliged to make this the kind of society, the kind of planet, the kind of 
closed system that we want it to be. So I'll stop there and just give you my contact information. I didn't bring any cards, so if you want to do that, write th contact me, write that down. Um, and if you're tagging things, you can throw that hashtag or that uh, Twitter handle on there too. Uh, and if anybody wants to become a member of Sustainable Pittsburgh, there's also information about that in the back. Uh, thank you very much. And <laughs> you give me a question. <laughs> you are all great. Um, <laughs> Say a little bit more about justice. Um, you, you, you introduced the concept really in uh, the context of generativity in future generations. Could you think about justice and how do you do that? How do I talk about justice? And I introduced the concept talking about future generations, but how could I say a little bit more about it? Um, sure. I mean, I think that there's a couple ish there's a couple things I I brought up um, as personal drivers for me. Um, one of which is this idea that we really uh, need to be responsible people, right? We teach our kids to clean up our ro their room, and then, you know. Societal, societally, you know, we're not doing such a good job of that. But I think justice itself has another whole aspect, right, which is um, this equity piece of sustainability, too. So we're not just talking about justice and our uh, obligations to future generations. We're also talking about justice and our obligations to each other right now. Um, there was a, I don't know how many of you saw, there was a uh, study that was just released this week that was looking at air pollution burden on different populations and you know talking about the equity impacts of you know pollution that's created in one place and affecting you know some people and then goes somewhere else and is dis disproportionately um, affecting people usually people of color right um, and that's there's a heavy overlap between environmental justice communities climate justice communities and communities of color. Um, that's uh, an indicator of an injustice that we need to be thinking about as we're talking about solving these problems as well. We have a chronic <laughs> racial injustice problem in this area, um, and that's something that is getting more attention. So I think it's really about how do we make society more fair, and how do we make that society more sustainable in the in the literal sense, like how do we sustain that fairness? First of all, thank you. Really. Yeah. 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 I think our society is has changed to make recycling a better economic model for the city? Um, uh, how, how do we go about that and what, what do we do? Well, that's a, that whole um, question sort of encapsulates a very important and pressing issue. One of the reasons that, um, one of the things that was brought up by the Straw Forward Project and how do we carry this, this issue forward. Um, recycling, okay, taking another step back. 
people often don't think about or we're never told, right, that when we think about the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, those are in order. They're, it's, a, it's an ordered list. It's, it's reduce, then reuse, then recycle, you know, as much as you can. And so I think, well, for one thing, I think that to solve the solid waste problem, what we actually need to do is we need to focus more of our efforts on those first two R's, on, on the reduction um, and on the reuse so that we just aren't generating as much waste as we otherwise would. And then the specifics of how do you make recycling an an, a thing that actually works um, economically for a municipality, that's a bigger question. Um, right now, uh, you know, some, some places have stopped taking glass, right? And that's actually not because it's not economically viable to take glass, it's because um, the way that it's collected, our single stream uh, recycling efforts, the way that it's collected um, bangs up the glass a lot. So it gets into all the other streams and then that's a very laborious process to separate and we don't have a very good way to do that. And so people have just said, okay, we're just not taking it even though it's actually an economically viable thing. If you have a, a, a pure glass stream, it's a very recyclable material. Um, when it comes to plastics, that's a whole other issue. In some ways, we have been, uh, for years, for decades now, kind of sold a fiction about the recyclability of plastics, right? Um, we recycle ones and twos. Um, most of the rest just gets shipped off to some, be somebody else's problem where they either incinerate it or it accumulates in piles, right? And so the, for a while, our, the major recipient of that had been China and they said, we're not taking your garbage anymore. And so now we have, well, what are we gonna do with all these plastics? I thought we were recycling, which is actually another good point. I know I promise not to ramble too much, but this is actually another good point is that recycling is such a great example to me of everybody wanting to do the right thing. And like this collective action, it, it actually, like the fact that we can't recycle some of this stuff or kind of the, the, the blinds are being peeled away from what that actually means right now is kind of, you know, people are very angry about this and are very concerned and really want to figure out how to do this better, right? Because it was the thing we were doing. We were recycling. Um, so I think it's actually a really good indicator of, you know, people wanting, wanting to help. Uh, but I think we do need to be more realistic about what materials we're actually creating and what their whole entire life cycle looks like, you know, at, from the get-go, rather than just being faced with this enormous, massive problem. And uh, to the question of um, what can be done at a systems level, there are things like bans, there are fees that can be imposed, there are um, different kinds of large consumer producer actions that can be taken too, right? If, you know, your grocery store is encouraging reusable bag use, that usually creates less of a need for plastic bags, for instance. Um, so there's lots of different mechanisms that can be used, but they really, I think, all start from us facing that this is something we need to focus on and be concerned with and let everybody know that. Sorry, that was a really long answer, so I'm going to take. So Jamie Smith has his, like, you know, superhero cape on, and I'm wondering, is he going to save Flint? Is there hope <laughs> in, in his mission there? Hmm. Um, in Flint, Flint, Michigan, you mean? Yes. I think, as someone who has worn a cape myself, <laughs> I think that... It is very important to draw attention to the issue, to the issues, whatever those are that you're concerned with. In Flint, of course, it's water and lead in water. Um, I think that it really takes the action of a community and the investment at multiple different levels. So I guess my best answer is we'll see because it takes the buy-in, right, at a lot of different levels. It takes municipal buy-in, it, um, it takes popular consciousness, uh, it, takes, uh, it takes private sector awareness and pressure as well. Um, it takes a lot of different things. So, Flint is a tough one. And what about the mechanism? 
Well, could you elaborate a little bit more on? Okay. <laughs> I I don't know too many details about this it, the the efforts that he's undertaking. Um, so I can't answer the question. We'll go with that. <laughs> 